Come on, put your hands together one more time in the building. Give a couple people next to you a high five. Say, what up? How you doing? Tell them the Rockets are going to get them next time. The Rockets are going to get them next time. Man, can I be honest for a second? I was salty, man, when the refs didn't call the foul on my man Harden. That's a foul. Sorry, some of you non-basketball sports people are like, oh my gosh, you are so not spiritual. I can't believe you're talking about basketball in the house of God. This is the house of God. <laughs> but we are the house of God, and uh, Houston needs some extra favor. I, no lie, this weekend, I saw a lady sitting over in this section who was wearing a full warrior's outfit. She had a shirt, she had like a kimono that was a warrior's kimono. I almost got security immediately and just tossed her out. Like, you cannot be here. We love you, but you need to worship online. That, that'll be fine with me. As a matter of fact, I wanna welcome all of our guests, all of our visitors. Would you give them a hand? Warriors fans or not, we love you. And if you're tuning in online, thank you so much. Those of you also listening on Sirius XM, what is it, 128. Hey, I'm so glad to have you as well. Can we pray together? Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity to come together. We do view it as an opportunity. This is a blessing in the scheme of the whole world, in view of the whole world, this is a rare treasure that your people can come together unafraid and unapologetically worshiping you. So thank you. Thank you for those that have gone before us and sacrificed and paved the way for us to be in this room tonight. I pray that you would speak through me or that you would communicate what you want communicated, not what I think I want to say, but what needs to be said. And I pray that you would give your people ears to hear hearts to receive, and I know that it's going to fall on good ground tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to sit down as well because I'm trying something, guys. I'm going to try and not holla back at y'all. I just want to be calm. I want to be reserved, but I also have ADHD, and I noticed that this spins. <laughs> so this is really cool and I like it a lot. Um, but I want to talk to you guys tonight and it's really my hope that I add true value to your lives. Uh, I don't want to be up here because this is a cool stage and all of you are awesome and this looks cool on Instagram. I really, my heart is to speak into where I was at your stage and in your season of life. And there are some things that I wish that I knew and that I understood at the season of life that you guys are in. And really, what I want to speak about tonight is probably not going to be anything new for you but it's going to be from a different vantage point. So if you really value what it is that you came here for, I, I wish that you would write some notes down, get your phones out, write it down, uh, because you never know in the future when you're going through something, you, you can pull something from this, from this talk. You know, I really believe this, that we are made for more made for more. Each and every one of us, every person under the sound of my voice, you have been made for more. First of all, I want you to understand that you have been made. That the only thing in creation that God touched was you. He formed you out of the dust of the earth. There is an intimate relationship and an intimate connection between creation and creator, and you have been made. You have been formed skillfully, fearfully, and wonderfully by the hand of God. 
Because he is the creator of who you are, no one else gets to speak into what they did not create. No one gets to criticize what they did not create. God owns the exclusive copyright on your soul. He owns the exclusive copyright on your identity. He alone reserves the rights to tell you who you are and to speak who you are. There is no person, no teacher, no parent, no overseer, no voice in your head, no voice in culture that can override the authorship of Jesus Christ. You were made and you were made in his image. This is a perfect image that we have been formed around. The very humanity of Jesus is the blueprint by which we exist. So no one gets to talk down to you. No one gets to make you shrink to fit into the version of you that they are comfortable with. I was having a conversation recently and I'm not going to be able to sit down. I was having a conversation recently, and we were talking about how parents can become jealous of their very own children, that there can actually be competition between a father and the son. And, you know, the real hope, me being a father of three boys, is that these three young men grow up to exceed everything that I do, that they would do greater things. And so it is the same with Jesus. That sounds like a crazy idea. You mean I'm going to do greater things than Jesus? Yes. Out of his very own mouth, Jesus said, greater things than these shall ye do. You've been made for more. Made for more. And the voices of culture... Even the voices of religion would want to dismantle the very thing that was created inside of you that makes you unique. Because what makes you unique makes you powerful. And so if those voices can sabotage what makes you unique, he renders us powerless to fulfill our purpose. It's the very thing that you look in the mirror and despise about yourself that God can use. It is the very thing that you see in the rearview mirror of your life that you so desperately want to run away from that God will build his greatest platform to reveal his glory from. You were made for more. And we cannot allow the opinions of people to make us into a version of ourselves that Jesus did not call us to be. We were not called to be defeated. We were not called to be down and despondent. We are called to be victorious. We are called to live life on purpose and on mission with a particular assignment. And so many of us, that's where we start. We try to find our identity in the things that we're called to do. And it really flips who we are upside down. Because once we start getting recognized for what we are able to do, we forget that who we are is far more important. And we will trade our God-given uniqueness and calling and the very thing he created us to do for something that we do that gets celebrated more often. It's cool to sing songs. I love doing it. I do it for a living. It's amazing. It's a great opportunity. It's a gift. But I'm called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm not going to prostitute my calling just because you celebrate my gifting. Just because what you saw me do first, that doesn't mean it's going to be what you see me do last. Just because I may be good at something early doesn't mean I'm not able to develop the true calling that God has on my life. See, I, I want to speak to you about three different functions and ideas surrounding how you have been made. 
I'm going to write this at the bottom. Typically, you would start at the top, but I want you to understand that this is a foundational thing. Identity. Identity. Then we have calling. And then we step into assignment. See, many of us don't understand the wind up here, the wind of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. <laughs> Thank, yes, blow, Lord. Just come like a mighty rushing wind. If I could get a paper clip or something, that'd be fire. So identity to calling, calling to assignment. See, the very first thing we have to understand is who we are, who we are. See, the problem is, come on, legendary. Give Lauren a hand. Oh, my goodness. You're a mate. Um, ma'am, ma'am, um, did you tape? I need the tape on that side. Um, who are you? Who are you? Now, yes. Come on, tape it, Lord. Tape it, Jesus. It's two-sided tape. Come on, there's a ram in the bush. Praise God. Okay. Who we are. Now, here's the problem with this idea. You, you guys remember this? Think back to when you're a little kid and you first start having these conversations. The conversation in kindergarten goes like this. Boys and girls, we're going to draw a picture today of what you want to be when you grow up. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? Isn't it interesting that before we ever speak to our identity as a five-year-old, we start throwing what we're going to be into the mix. Before we start understanding that calling matters, that character matters, that heart matters. We get this picture of a thing that we want to be instead of a person that we want to become. And I want to flip that paradigm in your mind. When you're thinking about majors, when you're thinking about um, life goals, and when you're putting together your vision sheet, it shouldn't just be some stuff you saw on Pinterest. It shouldn't be you answering the question that you were asked as a five-year-old, what do you want to be? But you should start looking to some people in your life that have some characteristics of who you want to be. Because far beyond what you do is this idea of who you are. It is a much greater calling and a much greater gift to be known for who you are than what you do. It doesn't matter if you are at the top of your class if you're a jerk. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you are the most brilliant person that we have ever experienced. If you are so arrogant, no one wants to hear from you. It doesn't matter if you are the most fashionable person that you just have this eye for design and for color and how to put things together if you look down at every person that doesn't see it like you do. It's far more important to focus on who you are. And only God gets to speak into that. See, this was something that I have just come to grips with. If you ask me as a 15-year-old, I say, yeah, I know who I am. Ask me as a 20-year-old, I know who I am. Ask me as a 29-year-old, I know who I am. Ask me as a 30-year-old, I know who I am. 31, though. <laughs> 31, though. Everybody said 30 was going to be rough. 31, though. God started speaking to me and saying, man, 
all this what stuff, all this assignment stuff, that's all cool, but it doesn't matter if you don't know who I say you are. Things start coming into our lives. We get a little bay, you know what I'm saying? A little shot of easy. You know what I'm saying? And all of a sudden, that person becomes a part of our identity. We, we, we get into the school that we've been praying about getting into, finally. And now, it's all about the school colors and the school mascot and the degree, and we've attached academics to identity. Then we get the job that we want. We still don't really know who we are because we've never stopped to ask the question. And we get the job and we're making the money, but we go home and we're empty and we're lost and we're confused and we're unfulfilled and we're looking at the degrees and we're looking at the, the savings account and we're looking at our spouse and we're looking at our kids and then all of a sudden we're Instagramming father, husband, creative, doctor, songwriter, speaking to those things as if they are identity. Those are just titles. Those things come and they go, but who you are lasts. People will long forget what you do. They will always remember who you are and they will know who you are by how you treat them. See, we start with identity. God has the exclusive copyright to who we are. And then we move into the arena of calling. This is what I, I call like the big idea of your life. Simon Sinek calls this the why of life. Why? Once we know who we are, we start figuring out why we exist. Who will lead you to why? If you will really deal with who you are, if you will really look at your strengths and your weaknesses and evaluate them, if you will really consider your upbringing, your past, your heritage, you will start to uncover your future. If you really look at it, see, our idea and culture is I don't worry about all the things that happen to my life. I don't learn how to handle them. I learn how to cope with them. I bury what is broken inside of me. I don't really know who I am, so I'm lost. So I'm not asking the question, why my past? Why this disappointment? Why this failure? Why this school? Why these advantages? Why these opportunities? Because I'm just doing my best to survive every day because my heart is broken. But when we know who we are, it will lead us to why we do what we do. Why do we exist? There is a reason that you exist. There is a reason. If you are breathing, you have a purpose. That's not just something preachers say. That is the truth of who God says you are. If you are breathing, you have a purpose. And so somehow we have to figure it out. And how I've defined this for myself is I like to make it tweetable. If you can't say your why in 140 characters, you haven't defined it. Well, I... I I love people, you know, I'm a people person, seven on the Enneagram, big seven here. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm just, people bring me to life. It's great. And, you know, I like to sew in my spare time and I have seven cats. So Enneagram seven, seven cats, you figure it out. And, you know, I just, but, but we have to take a second and get it right. Struggle with it, wrestle with it. You're not going to sit down and in 10 minutes be like, yep, I know why I exist. Nailed it. Tweet it. 
I'll ask you in five years, it'll be different. If you don't think it through, think it through. This was mine, this was mine. Mind blowing, you're not ready. To call greatness out of others. I feel like that's the why of my life, to call greatness out of others. When I see someone with potential, it is hard for me to not just be like, do you know all the things that you can do? Do you know what you can become? Do you know what you can produce? Do you know? There is so much greatness inside of you. You're amazing. Oh, my goodness. People see that as weird. So I have to, like, build a bridge, you know, be normal, and then be like, hey, have you ever thought about doing this? Because I see it. And I want to call greatness out of other people. And a big reason for that is because somebody called greatness out of me. When I was 12 years old and going into the youth group, a youth pastor looked at me and said, hey, um, aren't you supposed to be in the children's ministry? Because I was like two feet tall. I was like, no, sir, I'm 12. So I can be in the youth group now. And just like that, my youth pastor just started speaking into me, calling things out of me that I didn't know exist. While everyone else was speaking negativity, this one student pastor said, I think you got something, bro. I want to help you develop it. Would take me into the sanctuary at 16, and I would put all my notes together for speaking and he actually worked at my high school as well, so I would come in during my lunch breaks and we would do five-minute moments of leadership, five minutes of leadership, and we would go through John Maxwell books, and I would bring him my messages, and he would go through and he would say, well, this doesn't really make sense, and that's biblically not true, so you can't say that. And, you know, he would help me tweak, and then, then we would go into the, the sanctuary, and he'd be like, all right, preach your message. Like, like right now, like when no one's here? <laughs> well, it's the moments when no one's here that creates the opportunities that get everybody there. So you might as well learn how to do it with nobody watching. <laughs> so I get up and I'd speak and he'd show me like where to go and I obviously didn't listen very well because it didn't get that much better, <laughs> but he tried. But he called greatness on me. In a culture that wants you to play limbo to see how low you can go, Jesus wants to see how high he can take you. He wants, he's a God of elevation, and he's looking for people who are humble enough that he can trust with moments of opportunity. We got to figure out why we do what we do, which leads me to this. What? Who, why, what? Identity, calling, assignment. Who has God called me to be? All my faults, all my struggles, all my strengths, all my experiences. Who has God called me to be? I am a child of God. It cannot be changed. It is not up for discussion. I am a child of God. The why of my life. I am called to call greatness out of other people. But the function of my calling, I call assignments. And that function can change. The problem is when the function becomes the foundation. See, a lot of people flip this. And it starts with what I do, and then I guess I'll wrap a reason around why I do it. And then I'll just say, yeah, that's who I am. I'm a worship leader. But this has to be the true flow. The identity is the foundational thing, calling and what. Now, the assignments can change. The Bible tells a story of a man named Abraham. Abraham had a son named Isaac. God told Abraham to take the son that he had been waiting for his whole life up to the top of a mountain and sacrifice him. And Abraham said, son, let's go. Assignment. So Abraham takes his son up to the top of this mountain, and he's preparing to do the unthinkable, 
the unimaginable that a father would take the very life of his own son. And as he raises that dagger in the air, God speaks, stop. Look, the Lord has provided for himself a sacrifice. And Abraham looked and there was a ram in the thicket. So this is where we get messed up in our ideology around Christianity and the functions of our assignments and our callings. We think if God said one thing, it is a lifelong assignment. Abraham, sacrifice your son Isaac. Hard thing, I'll do it. But what if Abraham was so locked into the first thing that he heard God say that he missed the next thing? What if he was so that God told me, I heard from God. Yes, we believe you, but has he spoken again? Because God won't change his mind, but he will reveal his will. And a lot of times we think, well, if his will doesn't align with my preferences or my idea, then it can't be right. Or I fall so in love with what I do that I forget about the God who called me to do it in the first place. And now my passion that's supposed to be directed at Jesus is now directed at the thing that he called me to do. And those things are not the same. And so Abraham, this is why he's called a man of faith, because he could hear God and obey. And in a moment that he's about to sacrifice his son, God speaks and Abraham pauses. Can you play the pause in life? Think about this. If Abraham would have followed through with the first assignment that God gave him and missed the next assignment that God gave him, he would have sacrificed his future. God, what do you want me to do next? I'm committed to now. I'm on the journey. I've got the wood. I'm doing everything that I can. But I'm listening to you speak because you can shift a direction in an instant. And if our identity is so wrapped up in what God has called us to do in our assignments, when this thing ends... We think it's the end of us. But God can shift it. The end of a relationship, you could be in a relationship and have a person that's assigned to you. There's something in this relationship for me to grow from and learn from. God has purposed it. But if my identity gets wrapped up in that person, the end of that relationship feels like the end of me. If my identity gets wrapped up in that assignment, the end of that career feels like the end of me. If I get wrapped up in in that, the end of that season feels like the end of me. But to everything there is a season, a time and a purpose under heaven. And God orchestrates the seasons of our lives. There are divine expirations. There are times when things come to an end. Relationships come to an end. I was in a band called Royal Taylor before I started my solo career. In a band called Royal Taylor. We put out two albums. They were both Grammy nominated. You could say it was going okay. It was going all right. We had some traction. We didn't have the traction that we wanted, but I felt like it was an assignment. It was something that God called me to do in a way that he called me to accomplish it, a specific way. 
I, me and my wife, we had a worship school called Prisma Worship Arts School, where we hosted lessons for four years, teaching over 4,000 lessons. It was an amazing time. Uh, that season came to an end. Royal Taylor came to an end. In a time that it was going well, I said, guys, I don't think I can do this anymore. And I had this idea that I'm willing to lay this down. And if I solely commit my focus to the local church, I'm completely fulfilled. I just love it. I just love church ministry. I love people. And I'm good with that. And so I had those difficult conversations, ended my time with my band and told my record label, I mean, I'm down to do something, but just so you know, like the commitment level isn't quite the same. I, I really feel the focus here at home from a local church. And they're like, okay, okay, well, let's, you know, let's just sign a, a three album deal and we'll do it, we'll see how it goes. And I thought, this was literally my thoughts. This will be cool, I'll do music as a hobby because I enjoy it, it's awesome, and then I'll really invest in the local church. Well then, I wrote this song and turned it in called Hills and Valleys, and I put it on my very first EP, no one cared, just so you know. Thank you for the cheers. You didn't care four years ago, sorry. You just, no one cared. So I put out this hip hop banger, undefeated, it was awesome, it got 200 downloads. Put out that next joint, Love is Action. It was number one for nine weeks on a radio format that you'll never hear. <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, this is affirming it. Like, yeah, music's a hobby. You know, lay that down. Then I get a call from my manager that says, there's a 90% chance you're going on tour with Lionel Richie. And I, I just, I only told my wife, because I was like, this isn't happening. <laughs> There's no way. He's a legend. He's light-skinned, but still, it's, <laughs> it's not going to work in my favor. Not today. And at the same time, I went to this radio event, and I played Hills and Valleys on piano, just me, hands trembling, never played like that in front of people. And the response was like, We'll play that on the radio. And then we were announcing, by the way, um, two months later, the official offer came through from Lionel, and it was like, yep, yeah, 22 cities, 20 minutes, you, Mariah Carey, me, let's do this. So I'm like, okay, God, um, I don't think the music as a hobby is going to work with all this happening. So then all this stuff happened with Hills and Valleys and it became one of the most downloaded songs, except for what a beautiful name. That song just, it got number one and so I didn't. And they won a Grammy. I'm not bitter, I just have to sing it every weekend and remind myself that I lost. Um, but since it's about Jesus, it's fine. Um, but I realized something Two things. One, when I was willing to lay down the what, to be who God called me to be, God opened up doors that I didn't even think were doors. <laughs> I didn't even know that Lionel Richie was, I didn't know to pray it. I didn't know to dream it. I didn't know to write it down, but there's something about surrendering what we have to whose we are because of who we are that allows God to activate himself in a supernatural way. Fast forward a few weeks, I'm sitting down with some of the guys from the team here, Steve Williams and Josh Beard, and we're just having lunch, and they're like, man, it'd be awesome if you played Hills and Valleys at Lakewood. I was like, 
Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, duh, I'll pay to play <laughs> at Lakewood. I mean, you serious? I stalk you guys. This is amazing. <laughs> and like six months later, after I begged them, they let me come, and then I got to lead worship on the team. And then that Sunday turned into a Monday, and it was like, hey, it'd be cool if you were here like once a month. And I was like, that would be cool, but that's not possible because I'm on staff at another church. And God just had a way of orchestrating all these things. I didn't know Lakewood was possible. I didn't know this music adventure that I'm on was possible until I was willing to just lay it down. But the main thing that we have to remember is we cannot, this is the second thing, sorry. The second thing that I learned from that was you cannot reach over what God is doing now for what you feel called to do next. You can't skip it. And that's why I feel like I wasn't going out. This was actually at a time when I was least invested in a music career that a music career unfolded. And so I felt like, God, you have gifted me with a what out of my why to call greatness out of people. I can do that in church. I could do that at Prisma. I could do that in a band. I could do that in Bible college. I can do it as a speaker. I can do it as an artist. I can do it as a designer. I can do it as a filmmaker. I can fulfill my calling in a myriad of ways, but how I do that is determined by this, and I can't reach over what God is actively doing right now for the place that I know I'm called to ultimately because somehow God uses the what's and these little assignments that he places in front of us and those assignments grow and grow and grow until suddenly you realize you have been assigned with the thing you never thought was possible and now that dream is just a reality that you wake up in every single day but the foundational thing and this is really what I want you to get tonight is I want you to do some heart work on identity because it all flows from this place. I love how Paul, and I'm closing with this, I love how Paul opens every single letter he writes to the New Testament church. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. But the first thing he always says, you can go through every, every book, he starts with Paul. He starts with Paul. Before he ever speaks a word, before he ever pens a sentence, before he ever shares divine revelation, before he ever tells of his troubles and being shipwrecked, shipwrecked and all of the things that he went through, the very first thing off of the tip of his pen onto the papyrus <laughs> is Paul. Why? Because his name used to be Saul. And he wants to make sure that in every church that he's writing to, that he knows his name has been changed and he knows who he is. Every letter, Paul. In particular, I love how he opens up Galatians. He says, Paul, identity, an apostle, calling, sent neither by human commission nor from human authorities, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. That verse has so much swag and it's just verse one. 
You want to talk about a verse that's dripping? Listen to Paul. Paul, an apostle, holla at me. Sent neither by human commission. Man didn't send me, so man can't stop me. Man didn't call me, so man can't criticize me. Man didn't commission me, so man cannot stop what it is that God has started in my life because I know who I am and I know of whom I have been convinced. It is Jesus of Nazareth. He is the bright and the morning star. He shine into my life in a supernatural way when I was on a road to Tarsus and there was an opportunity for me to meet with Jesus and Jesus changed my life and he sent me to do his work. You don't get to tell me who I am because I know whose I am. <laughs> Nor from human authorities. It's called drama right there. <laughs> and through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Can I tell you, God says who you are and you have been called. Every person has been called. This is not a calling for people on stages. I wish that we could reverse engineer this building. I wish, with all due respect, Compact Center, this is a move of God. With all respect, I would like to disassemble this platform. Like LED by LED, tile by tile, and I would like to do it in churches all over America because we have relegated callings to people on stages. We have relegated spiritual authority to people on stages. Now, yet, yeah, now listen to me. I am all about pastoral authority. We need pastors. You need a pastor. You need to be able to say, this man is the watchman on the wall for my soul. You never outgrow it. You never outmature it. You never out smarted. You can't become intellectual enough or knowledgeable enough of your word. It's not about if the pastor's smarter than you or if he understands more than you. There's a spiritual order to how God uses people and he starts from the head and it flows to the bottom. So we have to be under pastoral authority, but it is not the pastor's responsibility to fulfill my calling. There's a reason why there are thousands of seats and we could only get 200 people on this stage. Because the mission of the church and the calling of Jesus Christ isn't about microphones and platforms. It's about people understanding who they are so they can become the force activated in the world that God has called to redeem his people, the salt and the light who understands who we are, why we have been called, and to what we have been called. We have been called to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ. We have been called to preach to every tribe, every tongue, every language. You have been called to preach in a classroom, to preach in a hospital room, to preach on a bus route, to preach from a barber chair. You have been called to preach the gospel. It's not for the rich. It's not just for the poor. It is for every human being all across the earth. You have been called. You called. You called. We've been called to a purpose so much greater than ourselves, and there is no greater honor than to lose ourselves in the thing that God has called us to. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this night. Lord, I, I just pray that these words, like your word says, your word doesn't return void. So I'm not going to undermine what's been spoken with doubt. I'm going to speak faith and say that this word has hit the hearts of your people in just the right spot. 
that this word has hit the activation switch for some people that have been hanging in limbo, wondering if they have what it takes, wondering if they're the right person, wondering how in the world God could ever use them. I pray that I would just be one voice that raises the bar and the ceiling of expectation over your people, that we would believe that we have been called for such a time as this, that throughout the corridors of history, you have pulled the book of 2019 off the shelf and there are names in that book that are sitting in this room and there is a purpose and a design and a master plan for every individual. God, I pray that we would surrender our hopes, that we would surrender our dreams, that we would surrender our goals that we would surrender our aspirations, that we would surrender our guilt and our shame and our mistakes, that stuff doesn't matter. Those are the things that you use, Lord. Let us realize it. Step into who you have called us to be, why you have called us to be that person, and how we are going to fulfill it in the earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Why don't you stand to your feet? I want to do one last thing before we close here. And that is, for many of us in this room, this is not just a Sunday night thing. This is a life thing. And this is the greatest life that you could ever live. I believe that with my whole heart. It's not always easy. The road can be difficult, but it is always worth it. Because there is a promise on the other side of this journey called life and it's eternal life. And it is the greatest life that we could ever hope to live. And I wonder if there is anybody in this room that has been moved not by words, not by speech, not by rhetoric, but you've just felt something in your heart. And maybe your whole life you've been taught to build walls around your emotions and walls around things moving you at a deep level, but tonight I just feel like those walls are coming down. And that there are some people under the sound of my voice that have just been whispering a prayer under their breath. God, I want a fresh start. If I could just have a new beginning. So we want to afford you that great opportunity tonight not just to do life with us, but to do life with Jesus. It's the greatest gift that we could ever receive, the unmerited grace of Jesus Christ. That grace is for you. That grace is for me, a sinner in need of a savior. Tonight, I want us to all pray together, but first I wanna ask, If you're in the room and you want to make a fresh start, every head bowed, every eye closed, you want to make a fresh start, you want to make a new beginning, you want to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, I want to invite you to raise your hand. You can slip it up right now. You can slip your hand in the air. There's one, two, three. Come on, if you want to make a fresh start today, you can come to this altar and find the open arms of Jesus. No judgment, no condemnation. He didn't come to condemn the world, but that we might have life and have it to the fullest. Those of you that raised your hands and everyone else in the room, would you repeat this prayer after me? Jesus, thank you for coming after me. I'm here tonight because of you. I see the sin in my life, but I see your grace, and it's so much brighter. God, forgive me of my sins. I want to follow you, heart and soul, forever, in Jesus' name. And the church said amen. Come on, put your hands together. Come on, put your hands together and celebrate.
those that are committing to making a fresh start, a new commitment to Jesus. We are so thankful. Listen, we, we look at this as just the, the beginning point for us all, that we step from here into this next week, and we know this to be true. Pastor Nick says it all the time. You can do this alone, but it's so much better to do it with people. So if you would be so kind, come roll with us, man. We would love to have you a part of this family, a part of this faith community. We really just happen to believe that God uses broken people to change the world that we're living in. And we want you to be a part of that story. Thank you guys so much for being here tonight. If you made a commitment, I would love for you to step right this way at the end of this gathering. You can head right over to these doors. Terry and Ashley are right there, wave at us. What's up? Some of the best people you'll ever meet in the world and you can step over there but for the rest of us thank you guys so much let me just say this may God bless you and keep you may God go before you and show you his favor and have mercy on you may the Lord watch over you and give you his peace in Jesus name amen